As we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., it is especially meaningful to hear from one of his dear friends. So today I'm sitting down with Sinai Grace's own Dr. William Anderson. Dr. Anderson, lots of people know you for your work in medicine, um, but you also played a key role in the American Civil Rights Movement, and you were a per close personal friend with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Tell me how you met him. I was fortunate enough to uh, marry a lady who was, um, uh, who was a very good friend of the King family. As a matter of fact, my late wife uh, had a brother who was the same age as Martin Luther King Jr. and they were classmates in high school and in college. So when we got married, having no resources of my own, stayed with my mother-in-law. So Martin Luther King Jr. would visit my mother-in-law's home almost on a daily basis because he and my brother-in-law both were aspiring ministers and I would have to listen to them practice their preaching ad nauseum regularly, so much so that at one point I said, why don't you just shut up? I did not realize that I was telling a future world leader, Nobel Peace Prize winner, to shut up. But that's how it happened, and a friendship developed from that first meeting. What was Dr. King like before he was a civil rights leader? What was he like as a person? He was a fun-loving student, as most were. As a matter of fact, I can say he perhaps enjoyed life more than most people because he enjoyed what he was learning to become. In other words, his father and an uncle and grandfather had all been ministers, and he was aspiring to one day be a minister. But he also, he did not get much involved in athletics, but he was more involved in, in other activities. He enjoyed debate, and more than anything, he enjoyed practicing his preaching. So I don't think that you would have anticipated that one day he would become the kind of world leader that he became because he was more or less an average kid that has ambitions of a life career in the ministry. Before becoming involved in civil rights yourself, you had a successful practice in Georgia. Tell me what it was like practicing at that time. Being an African American first and being an osteopathic physician second, meant that I could not get hospital privileges in the town where I practiced because neither an African American or an osteopathic physician could belong to the state medical society. That was a prerequisite for joining a hospital staff. But when I entered practice, I just assumed hospital privileges. I just thought, if you're a doctor, you had hospital privileges. Until they found out that I was putting patients in the hospital and I was managing the patients until the hospital administrator found out that I was a DO and I was black, called me to his office and said, are you a member of the State Medical Society? He knew I was not. Mm -hmm. But you have to belong to that society in order to have staff membership. So my practice was office-based, but I did a lot of work in the homes. I delivered babies in the home. Mm -hmm. As many as 200 babies I delivered in homes, sometimes by the light of my automobile. Mm -hmm and I did a lot of minor surgical procedures in my office. It was a rewarding practice because there were many patients there who did not have the opportunity to get cared for by a doctor. The doctors that would see them, the white doctors in town who would see patients, they were usually after hours in the back door, and I would say substandard care was given. Mm -hmm. So I provided a type of care that patients could get with dignity and with some concern for their overall well-being. So I had a great practice in rural Georgia, even with limited facilities. And is that what spurred you to become involved in civil rights yourself? Certainly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, and I guess what prompted me to get involved was the student's effort to start a voter registration project. That is, blacks in rural Georgia and in much of the South, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Blacks could not get registered to vote. They could not vote. And a student group known as the Students' Nonviolent Coordinating Committee came into Albany, Georgia, where I was practicing, and they started encouraging blacks to go and get registered to vote. Needless to say, they were not encouraged to do so by the white establishment, and the clerk that would do the registering would always manage to take a long break for lunch, like days on in, or the, or she would be out sick, 
or they could not register to vote because they couldn't read and interpret the Constitution. There were all kinds of reasons why we could not get registered to vote. So the students who were leading the demonstrations, taking the people down to get them to register to vote, were harassed, they were arrested, they were threatened, they were intimidated. And I saw them doing that, and I was in the comfort of my office with a great practice, mind you, mm -hmm. but I saw these kids placing their own personal safety at risk to get these people, my people, and me registered to vote, mm -hmm. and I was uncomfortable with that. So I got out there and joined in with them, and they eventually elected me as the leader of the movement. Mm -hmm. It was by default. Nobody else wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was, we, the elders of the city, perceived that the students were taking the lead. And much like Mahatma Gandhi who said, I have to get in front of those people because I am their leader, we were the so-called leaders of the community, yet these students were taking the lead in getting our people to register to vote. Mm -hmm. So we called together all of the organizations that comprise the titular heads of Albany. They were the NAACP, the SCLC, the Urban League, and some social group and civic groups. We called them all together, and we decided that we have to have an organization. Now, there was no organization. It was just the students. Mm -hmm. There was no organization. There was no leadership. So we decided then that we would become the Albany movement, not having any identity with any of the other organizations, this was not an NAACP movement or SCLC movement or Urban League movement. This was an Albany, people's movement, if you would. And so I was elected president only because I'd only been there a short period of time. I had not been there long enough to aggravate enough people <laughs> <laughs> that I could not get their support. Mm -hmm. And that was the genesis, actually, of what became the Albany movement, which was the first grassroots mass movement in the civil rights era. Mm -hmm. and during your fight for equality, you were jailed several times, some of which were with Dr. King. Tell me what that was like for you. Well, I guess we were jailed together several times. We were put out on the work gang several times. Mm -hmm. But I guess the most dramatic point was when Martin Luther King was to go on meet the press. Mm -hmm. And we were in jail at the time. And he had vowed he would not come out of jail until the white establishment, I'm talking about the members of the city council and the mayor, until they would sit down and discuss with us anyway the issues relating to segregation and discrimination. He was not going to come out of jail. He had vowed that. Mm -hmm. And Lawrence Spivak was on the phone all day that Saturday preceding the Meet the Press, which was to be the following Sunday, pleading with him to come out of jail. And of course, the chief of police did not want him in that jail because whenever Martin Luther King was in jail, the press of the world came into town. Mm -hmm. And the town was virtually paralyzed. No business was going on. No shopping was going on. So they wanted him out of jail. So there were three of us in the same cell. Martin Luther King, Abernathy, and I were in the same cell. And Martin said, being on Meet the Press to get our message out to the world it's sufficiently important that one of us has to go out of jail to go and meet the press. And we sat there, get this, in jail, rural Georgia, drawing straws. And I drew the short straw and he says, Andy, you gotta go and meet the press tomorrow. What, me? <laughs> well, I came out of jail just to go and meet the press and that's how I wound up there. But we were in jail many times. Mm -hmm. I cannot say I enjoyed it, being in jail is a depressing experience, one that I don't wish on anybody. Mm -hmm. But we felt as though this was for a just cause. Mm -hmm. And as we remember Dr. King, what would you like people to know about him and his dedication to the betterment of others? If there's any such thing as a calling, a divine calling, if you would, whether you are religious or not, I do believe that there are are people on this earth that have a purpose in life. I believe that Martin Luther King's purpose in life was to be that civil rights leader, I do believe. Mm -hmm. His time had come, and I think this nation was ready for a leader like him. There were many of us in the Deep South who had come to accept 
our situation of segregation, discrimination, being treated second class citizens, denied the right to register and vote, we had come to accept that because we did not know how to get out of that mire until he came along and he said, there's a way out. And we questioned how? We can't fight these people. We have no guns, we have no tanks, we have no airplanes. How are we gonna fight them? He said, there's a better way. You can do it with prayer and nonviolence. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated that in Montgomery, and we came to believe that it could be done that way. I don't know anyone else other than Mahatma Gandhi who had the moral persuasion and the moral power to lead literally thousands, yea, millions of people to peacefully protest to change the social order as it existed in the South. That was his calling. And as a civil rights leader and uh, someone dedicated to the care of others, what do you think of the progress that we've made and where we're headed? It is easier to change the laws than it is to change the hearts and minds of people, let me say that. <laughs> because there are still people fighting the Civil War, even today, and the Civil War been over with how many years? <laughs> I don't believe that you can restrain the heartless, but you cannot change the heart. So our first objective was to restrain the heartless. That is, let's stop the cross burnings of the Klan. And they burn the crosses like a half a block from my home. Let's stop the lynchings. And we were able to get some anti-lynching laws in place. Let's get blacks the right to register and vote, which would change the political climate. We were able to accomplish those things legally it was even more difficult to change their hearts and minds, the way they think. At one point, the chief of police, Laurie Pritchett, turned out to be a very good friend of mine, chief of police, as he was arresting me, put his hand over his heart and he said, Doc, do you think this is the way to make people like you? And I said to him, Chief, you'll never know whether you like me or not, as long as we're kept apart. Mm -hmm. We became the very best of friends before he died. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that are things better now? Yes, I don't have to sit in the back of the bus unless I want to. I can register and I can vote. But every once in a while, racism rears its ugly head. So we have a lot of work yet to do. And that other major hurdle is to change the hearts and minds, the way people think. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. That's why we still need to have some civil rights activity, maybe not marching, going to jail, but one-on-one -on -one so that you get to know me. And as you get to know me, you'll find out that we have the same ambitions in life. We all want the same thing for ourselves and for our children, our grandchildren. We're not that much different. Mm -hmm. You know, we might fight politically. We hope that it not ever get reduced to what happened on Saturday where we kill off our leaders because we don't like their positions but we can debate them, we can discuss them, but there should be a common cause, and we're not there yet. Dr. Anderson, it's really been an honor. Thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome.